Next, we have Anand Sirvasan. Anand is a junior at Roswell High School and a 2011 Google Science Fair finalist and also a 2012 Davidson, final, uh, Davidson Fellow. Um, he was also honored with, uh, with the opportunity to attend the 2012 uh, White House Science Fair. Um, his project involved writing a more efficient signal filtration algorithm uh, for the purpose of creating a robust brain-computer interface that he used to control a prosthetic arm by thought alone. Um, he hopes that such software-based methods will allow assistive technologies to someday emulate the human body in the process of making lives easier through technology. Anand? What do you think about when you hear the word robot? Most of us would probably imagine some metallic being with surprisingly human-like qualities, often showing a desire for world domination, the thrill of discovery, and even friendship. And most of us probably don't imagine robots as looking like this. But until a few years ago, I was most interested in robots that look exactly like that. Simple little mechanical creatures that scurried around or followed bright lights, often leaving stole tracks in the carpet. And I still don't know how my parents put up with it. But I was most fascinated by anything that moved. Even if all it could do was crawl and leave a trail of battery acid behind it. Hey. But by the end of middle school, I had this question that was growing in my mind, and I couldn't ignore it any longer. What was it about Pixar's little robot that made it seem as endearing and poignant as a human child? Why was it nothing like the mechanical, emotionless creatures people had always told me about? Then I realized it was their minds, their intelligence, not their mechanical arms, that made both R2-D2 and WALL-E seem so memorable. And from then on, the questions kept coming. <laughs> Could machines ever learn from the world as we do? Could there ever be more to, the movement, more to their movements than a simple automation? Could there ever be an intelligence behind these actions? More than what humans could dictate in programs? Maybe even more than humans could comprehend? Could a robot ask questions of its own? Of course, like every other kid, I'd seen Terminator and iRobot and WALL-E, but the machines in media and movies seemed so implausible, so vastly distant from my Windows computer, that I never really considered their existence or what they might mean for humanity. But somewhere, something clicked for me, and I began to ask deeper questions. Can machines ever learn as we do? Then one day, I happened, to read, I happened to see a 60 Minutes documentary about Aaron Ralston, the mountain climber who sadly was forced to amputate his own arm in the Grand Canyon in order to save his life. And when I saw his Captain Hook-like prosthesis, I was immediately shocked and inspired. I no longer just wanted to make things move, I wanted to make them think. And for the first time, I realized the true implications of the phrase artificial intelligence. From this simple question, an idea had formed. The idea that I could somehow make the world a little easier to live in, ease the circumstances of the less fortunate through intelligent machines, learning machines. And of course, why risk a firefighter's life when a robot could simply roll through the flames? Your car can tell you if your seatbelt's not on, but why not have it put on for you? Or for that matter, drive itself. At the time, I suspected that these visions were somewhat fantastical, but they pushed me to learn and discover and research topics for myself I wouldn't have dreamt of otherwise. And I'd just begun to realize the true meaning of the word or phrase artificial intelligence. And I just couldn't shake the feeling that if I could somehow somehow create a robotic arm that could respond directly to a person's thoughts, that could respond intelligently to a person's impulses as my own arm responds to me. It might someday serve as a suitable replacement for the, robotic, for the human arm, and might someday enable Aaron Ralston to climb mountains again. This simple question, along with the story of a man whose life was transformed by technology, 
changed me as a person. I no longer had just a childish fascination to fuel my dreams. I had motivation. I had a purpose for doing what I love to do and a goal to pursue for the rest of my life. And I had, at the time, I hadn't quite realized what a beautiful or valuable thing motivation was, or that I was willing to forego sleep, parties, video games, and even my favorite science fiction books for something that, to me, was higher than all else, until I asked myself, what if? So that summer, I had discovered a passion. And for the next 13 months, I spent, uh, for the next 13 months, spending nearly four hours daily, I jumped headfirst into my idea, formulating hypotheses, researching, coding feverishly. I wanted to create a robotic arm that could respond intelligently to a person's thoughts. And a year later, my project was complete. I had managed to create an arm that was connected wirelessly to a portable electroencephalograph on my head and, was, and through the training software I'd created, was able to respond to certain patterns in my, in my brain signals. What I'd done was develop a more efficient filtration algorithm so that the patterns within those brain signals were more easier to detect. Kind of like watching a TV with less static so you can hear what the hero's sidekick is saying. Of course, it wasn't this successful from the start. And actually, when I first plugged it in, the first thing it did was accelerate toward my, toward my head and break its plastic wrist. <laughs> but in the summer of 2011, it led me to the Google Science Fair, where I was a finalist, and allowed me to tour the Google campus while meeting 14 of the smartest young people in the world. And this was actually the first ever online science fair, meaning that anyone in the entire world could participate, and all they needed was a computer and an idea. And I remember thinking that at the time when my teacher told me about this, this was a true sign of how much our society had evolved. Cardboard displays and three-hour drives were a thing of the past. Rather than filling out stacks of forms, all we needed to do was an eight-step write-up, along with a video or slideshow showcasing our work. This meant that for the first time, teenagers in rural India could showcase their inventions for the world to see. And because of this, I believe it's really brought together the teenagers all over the world for the sake of science. And to me, it was, simply, it was simply humbling to see that kids in India or China or Asia had all put aside their other activities for the sake of science. So to, when I found out I was one of the 60, 60 semifinalists and then one of the 15 finalists, I was shocked beyond comprehension. To think that I had been selected among so many bright young people was simply mind-boggling. Then in February of, the, of this year, I had the honor of meeting President Obama at the White House Science Fair, an exhibition consisting of 40 scientifically-minded kids from all over the nation. And at this point, although the real reward was the knowledge I'd gained in the process, I became aware for the first time of the breadth of opportunities available to teenagers like myself, passionate young people who want to change the world. So this is my point in sharing my idea and sharing my story with you today. You, the teenagers of today's generation, the millennium generation, have more opportunities than ever to pursue your passion with everything, even college courses being outsourced to the almighty cloud. It's more possible now than ever for you to seek answers to your own questions, and in the process, achieve truly great things. The cutting edge of today, the badly needed skill, the thing that will put our country on top, it's not of having a great time, but rather of having great ideas. And the more questions you ask now, the, more, the better prepared you will be to face them later. And if you remember, 100 years ago, the greatest contest in the US wasn't between Democrats and Republicans, but between Thomas Edison and Nikola Tesla for something as simple as alternating current. And like them, you will be called upon to solve our world's problems. The next economic or environmental or medical crisis will fall into your hands. And the more questions you ask, will never run out of answers. As I discovered, it all starts with something so simple, yet so essential to life, a question. 
This question, which has allowed, which which has enabled Einstein to comprehend the smallest bits of matter known to man, Francis Bacon to delineate the scientific method, is what drives our society today. And the truth is, seeking answers to your own questions will define you as an individual, as a leader rather than a follower. And our world needs leaders and scientists. We need them to solve our, uh, to clean up spills from the Gulf, to solve our dependence on oil to prevent reactor meltdowns, and more importantly, to create bigger iPhones. <laughs> <laughs> so, and as, as I discovered, this, this, it, this simple, essential thing to life, that which enabled Francis Bacon to delineate the scientific method, and allowed us to fly Neil Armstrong 240,000 miles from home to be the first man to walk on the moon, all of that discovery and knowledge and power to do great is locked behind two simple words. What if? Thank you.